Well, a new study suggests astronauts need three years between trips into space for their brain to recover. Joining me now live is astrophysicist and cosmologist at ANU, Brad Tucker. Brad, good to see you. Gee, three yeah. years, that's a long time. So <laughs> what actually happens then to the brain in space? Yeah, look, and this is all part of this growing body of evidence that shows there's a lot of physiological changes during long duration space flight, meaning six to eight months to a year. And a lot of this has to do with pressure and gravity, that when you're in space, the change in pressure, and particularly the change in gravity, the the microgravity environment they're exposed to, changes a lot of ways fluids in particular move in the human body. And this is now, as you said, been extended to the brain. And, and what they notice is the ventricles, so parts of the brain that during their trip into space and after they come back, it kind of like spaces out, that it in fact almost expands in a certain way due to, they think, the lack of gravity the astronauts are exposed to. And it's not a, a one-off exposure, meaning they looked at astronauts who only spent one to two to three weeks in space, the short duration flights, and then the long duration flights. And in the long duration flights, that's when they noticed this change. And then that's also when they noticed how long it took to recover. As you said, nearly three years for this to recover. And some of these issues, as you're seeing, are not just brain, there's cardiovascular problems. Your eye changes in space. You have problems with bone loss and calcium, and that calcium can build up in the kidneys and create kidney stones. Your tongue is different in space. There is a ton of problems and changes the human body goes through. Now, the good news is most of these do recover, but again, sometimes it can take years for this to happen. Why we all worry then in the case of Mars. Mars, it takes six months to get there, plus staying there and coming back. You're looking at a two to three year trip easily. If you're going to Mars, you, you can't recover after six months to a year. So what's going to happen to those astronauts? This is a big body of work that they're trying to get through. That's almost frightening, really. It, it would yeah. make you second guess your job. But in the end, I guess you know what you sign up for uh, when That's you become right. an astronaut. It's not a very common job. So, uh, yeah, I take my hat off to people that do that. Now, let's move on. If we've got any Star Wars fans out there, Brad, they're going to like this one because astronomers have found a rare planet that resembles the fictional planet in that movie franchise. What is it? Uh, Tatooine. So uh, Tatooine is made famous, as he said, in, in, in Luke Skywalker's home in Star Wars, uh, is a planet that is what we call a circumbinary planet, a planet that orbits two stars. So obviously we orbit one in our solar system, but most of the stars in the nighttime sky are two, sometimes three or four star systems. So if we're going to find planets, the likelihood is, uh, as we're seeing with Skywalker on the screen, is that you're going to have two stars that you're orbiting and you would have two suns, that you would have not just one sunrise, but two and two sunsets accordingly. Uh, and so it's not a surprise that they exist. It's just in how many we keep finding and how kind of exciting it is the range that we get. Now, the planet is 65 times heavier than Earth, uh, and it orbits about every 217 days. So very different than Earth than even Luke Skywalker's home, more of a, a gas planet or an ice giant, as we see in the edge of our solar system, but definitely showing just the range of almost science fiction worlds that lie out there in our galaxy. Yeah, there you go. Star Wars was just ahead of its time. It just exactly. knew, didn't it? It just knew. <laughs> now, scientists, Brad, they've discovered that Saturn's moon has all the ingredients for life on its icy ocean. So I guess the question, is life there? Yeah, look, this is this is the billion dollar question at this point, because every time we start studying a different aspect of these moons, in this case, Enceladus, we discover this, as you said, so phosphorus. So there's six main ingredients that we need for life. We're obviously a carbon based life form. So most of the things in our body are carbon. But phosphorus is another important ingredient and the smallest ingredient. But looking at data from the uh, Cassini probe that studied uh, Saturn and its moons, like Enceladus up close, they found in the data phosphorus present. So that in these geysers shooting off of the moon, as you just saw, they saw not just water coming out of it, but phosphorus. So everything that we keep looking for and finding appears to be underneath this ice and icy crust uh, of this moon. So 
Oh, man, it's it's closer and closer every day that we're going to get that answer. And one day we finally will. I can't wait for the day that you and I have that discussion. <laughs> every week we get closer, but one day we will have that chat, That's Brad. Right. Now, this is exciting. Virgin Galactic has announced plans to launch its first commercial space flight this month. So what can we expect from that launch? That's right. So, you know, we saw back in 2021, they raced to do some of their test flights that including people, including famously Sir Richard Branson. And they've been getting ready for commercial operation. And as you said, now on the 27th of June, uh, they have a three-day window for their first commercial flight. This will actually take some Italian uh, astronauts up for some training and preparation. But they are now at the point where they will start monthly flights. So that on the 27th of June, they will have that first one. And then pretty much every three to four weeks thereafter, they will resume commercial operations because they actually have a lot of customers who've already paid for these flights. So they want to get going. They want to get moving. Uh, we saw Blue Origin uh, enter the commercial market quite rapidly. They have been on pause as they investigate uh, an accident with their rocket a number of months ago. So the commercial sector is still uh, there. It's still in demand. And what Virgin Galactic wants to do is to get these commercial flights going regularly so they can upgrade their next generation of planes to take more passengers and more regular, hoping for weekly flights coming in 2026. Oh, it's exciting. Uh, we're running out of time, but just quickly, can you tell us about the space plane itself? Yeah, so the way it works is there's kind of two parts. There's a larger part of the plane that actually takes the lifting up into kind of how a normal plane would fly the distance. And then you actually have these space planes. So the space plane is attached to this long winged air, uh, normal aircraft. The space plane drops and then uses an onboard rocket to then propel you up to about 80 to 85 kilometers. So you're reaching the point where you can actually start to see curvature, experience that floating around. But because you have a plane that takes you part of the way up, you don't need all of the energy a normal rocket would because the plane itself is doing some of that effort. So the engine on board the space plane can be a bit more smaller and more effective and therefore lighter, which means durable and hopefully doing it more often. Well, it's going to be interesting to see how these rehearsals go for the big event. So looking forward That's to right. seeing that. Brad, lovely to speak with you as always. Thanks for joining us. Thanks.